challenges facing Muslim family. I believe that most of those challenges would fall perhaps into three categories. Categories that deal with the matter of Iman, understanding of true Islam, and the practice of Islam. And before I delve into some of these issues, I'd like to point out that all three categories are interrelated and interdependent. How? If there is no correct Iman, there is no in-depth Iman, and personal agendas. It could lead to particular selective perception. So Islam is understood the way I want, according to my own agenda. So it could lead to misunderstanding as well as wrong action as well, misbehavior. Sometimes Iman is there, but Islam is not understood correctly, resulting in over looseness over strictness, legalism, and sometimes could lead also to misbehavior, as we find in the Kharijites in the early days of Islam, as prophesied by the Prophet ﷺ, there were people who so pious, fast a lot, pray a lot, yet because of their narrow understanding of Islam, they committed things that are abominable, like killing other Muslims who don't agree with their narrow understanding. But suppose you have the correct understanding. It is not enough. If we have the correct understanding of Islam, but Iman is not there, personal agenda is more important, it could lead us again to misbehavior, and in due time, it could even twist our correct understanding of Islam. Basically, what I'm saying is that all three are interrelated. Now, the first category of problems, problems with Iman. I believe a lot of problems facing Muslim families everywhere, and particularly in the West, might actually be rooted in problems with Iman, more so than understanding. Unless the components of the family realize and understand that the function of the family is derived from the function of the human on earth to be the trustee of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And family as an institution is one means of helping us, helping various individuals or members of the family to get closer to Allah, to show their love of Allah, and to help each other in the true practice of Islam. When that vision is not clear in our minds, not only do we neglect our spouses, but also we neglect our children because there is a higher value of materialism and making more money than looking after the children. There is the mistaken interpretation or impression that the best way to show love to your children is to bring, to get them cars and uh, video games and this and that, rather than to give them Islam, which is much more important than these passing things. When the Iman is not there, People won't even care what the Prophet did or didn't do or said or didn't say. They probably will not be aware, let alone willing to implement his teaching in relationship with wives, the best of you is to, to the best of, to of his family. What a great sin for a person to get those dependent children lost rather than caring for them. A person would be oblivious of the warning in the Quran, Ku anfusakum wa ahlikum nara, save yourselves and your children from a hellfire. If there is no iman, then the values in whatever society the person is living in become the ultimate point of reference, the frame of reference, and the foundation of their understanding and behavior, rather than the Quran and Sunnah to start with as the ultimate source. There are problems with understanding, the second category. And I promise to be brief because some of this can be clarified best through interactive part of the session. Even though I put it as second, but it is very important also. Because a lot of time people mix up between 
practices of Muslims and Islam between Islamic culture, which is based on Islam, and Muslim culture. Let me make a distinction here. To me, Islamic culture that is worthy of the name Islamic could be cultural practices that are based on Islam, rooted in Islam. Hospitality to guests, personal hygiene, that's fine. And you'll find that a common denominator among Muslims in various countries, irrespective, because it's based on Islam. But the tragedy is that there are lots of Muslim cultures, not culture, one culture, even cultures, some of which might be more or less common among some countries. I call it Muslim, not Islamic. That is done by Muslim, but it doesn't have to be Islamic, which are not really consistent with Islam. More tragic even is when some people think that those practices are rooted in Islam. Women should not go to the mosque. Why? That's Islam. Islam says this, as if I am Islam. I am Islam. You know, Islam says this. W what's the evidence? That's where the problem arises. Either there is no evidence, or there is one particular hadith or two taken out of the context of other hadith in the same topic, or one hadith that has been misinterpreted, you name it. All kind of methodological errors. I say this is more tragic because people keep pushing for that and they think this is what Islam demands. So basically, it behooves us not only to pay attention to lack of information on Islam, because a person who is ignorant of something might be more humble, say, I don't know, let me learn. The danger may come when a person is half educated and think that he became an instant mufti by reading a dozen books. That's where the problem arises. I would not reveal names or anything or particulars, but here one of the sisters was asking me some questions that gave me the clear impression that there are some people about whose intentions we cannot question, and I think they're sincere. But they have a strange understanding that even a person who just embraced Islam, they are told, you cannot wear silk, you have to do this, you have to do that, and things that are sunnah are made fard, and fard is forgotten, and so many things that are really surprised me to hear that anyone would tell a woman that wearing silk is haram for you. This did not come from someone who doesn't know anything about Islam, but if someone has the wrong information or partial information and start giving verdicts like that because he heard it from someone who heard it from someone who heard it from, from someone else, Allah knows what happened in this whole chain of communication, and we think it's Islam. A similar case when in some countries the girl is almost forced by parents to accept the husband chosen by the father. And many people say, oh, that's modesty because he is the wali, he is this, he is that, that's Islam. No, Islam doesn't say that. Actually, the hadith of the Prophet ﷺ contradict that. It, it's, you find it in my book, Gender Equity. If you don't have the copy, you can even read it in uh, Google. Google.ca and just you type the, in the search window, Gender Equity in Islam. That's not, that's not true at all. But when people think it's true, it becomes even more problematic. The third category of problem is our actions as Muslims. But I'd like to say from the very beginning that we're not unrealistic. We're not saying that uh, Muslim individuals or families can or should be perfect. The perfection belongs to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone. There are problems, there are bumps in the way. We have to recognize that. But at least what I humbly suggest for myself and others that first of all we have if we provide, if we work on our Iman, correct our understanding, to recommit ourselves to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That the, if you talk about husband-wife relation, or parent-children, or parent versus relatives, that our relationship should be from now on based on the correct understanding of the Quran and Sunnah, even if we go against the cultural practices of other Muslims that are not authenticated or against the Quran and Sunnah. I know it requires courage. Some people say, yeah, what you're saying is right, but how can I break with this? No, break it. Break it, if you have to. Because the Quran and Sunnah is the one that Allah will hold us responsible, not the culture of our people or back home or this. Secondly, whenever there is any 
problem between husband and wife, and that's bound to happen. There's no question about that. We should not let pride stand in the way on one side or the other. We should not be uh, overtaken by any isms, whether it's extreme form of feminism. I'm not saying all feminism is bad. Extreme forms of, of feminism that goes even against hadith or chauvinism on the other hand. We have to recommit ourselves if we're really fa trying to re-establish our lives in accordance with the Quran and Sunnah, to see the marital relationship, not that someone is married to his master or slave or employee, but partner, complementary, complementarity of the relationship, not a controlling relationship. And oftentimes the dispute between husband and wife might boil down to that. Control, and mostly men, of course. I mean, there are women also would like to control. But most often, the reaction, the severe reaction on the part of the husband, with whatever excuse is given, boils down to this. I am stronger. I am in control. I want to control you, right? This is something that's not limited to marital relationship, by the way. There is something in the human. We find it in history. We find it in contemporary society today. That when someone has power, sometimes they tend to the, the power gets into their head. Like they say, power corrupts. And absolute power, unopposed power, corrupts absolutely. Remember that. It's not my words. Cor power corrupts. And absolute power corrupts absolutely. A relationship, if a person really has that iman, he should have the humility. That the, my purpose in life is not to control this, my wife or my kid or my employee. To live according to the command of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That, that's the greatest control, not my control over someone else. Uh, whenever there is disputes, there is an endemic problem. So I do not wish to repeat what has been said about that. And those who have seen my humble little book, there is detailed discussion of this question of family abuse, of family violence. And, some, and the tragedy, again, is some, some people say that it's sanctioned by the Quran. No, it is not. And again, read the book. There is a detailed footnote about three pages and a half trying to explain the ayah and the way many people totally misunderstood it. <clears throat> now, one final remark is that while the focus of the presentation was only on these three areas in respect to family relations, and even I didn't do justice to that because there could be a lot also said, for example, about children and raising of, of children. I just wanted to conclude that we have to understand this also in the context of a broader society. In the context of our attempt in our Islamic centers and mosques to reinforce those values, to help educate ourselves and others about the true authentic Islamic values and family relations, to provide the support for one another in this understanding, in the practice, in the resolution of conflict and problem that might arise within our community so that we don't have to keep running to this or that to solve our problems. It's much better, and I admire the sisters in the panel when they talk about access to the masjid, that the, the more logical and uh, fruitful approach is to try first to resolve our problem within ourselves because there are a lot of people out there waiting for any small controversy to make it a big type of, of media event. So the same thing should be done also in resolving uh, family disputes. And again, we should not, never forget also the greater circle, the broader circle of relating to society at large. Um, this, I'd like just, just, not really a scholarly presentation or anything of that sort, I should just, a beginning, because I did promise Dr. Farouk that given the fact that you have gone through a very grueling, long day, uh, perhaps the question answer period might be less taxing on you, and perhaps, to me also, it's more enjoyable than giving lectures, to tell you the truth. A stepfather has no obligation you know, to spend on his stepchild, because in Sharia also, the father, irrespective of who's taking, who's the custodial parent, is responsible for the support of his own child. But Sharia cannot be just an abstract thing. There must be something also practical. If a person agreed to marry a woman who has a, you know, a child, from another marriage and if indeed it is difficult or impossible to get the uh, the father 
the, the biological father to support his child, then this should be an understood condition in marriage. And by the way, I'm not speaking for them. I know personally of a case like that, you know, that the husband says, don't worry, because the father was just disappeared, you know, nobody knows where he's about. So he, when she got married, she told him, look, I have that child, what can I do with it? He said, no problem, he's welcome, just like my own children, and I would raise him, I'll spend on him. That would be also a practical solution for what may happen here. But if the person is available, he should provide support. In terms of authority, obviously, the, uh, the person in that case could be, if it's a minor, then it is the duty, of course, of the mother, first of all, is if the, you know, to, uh, to direct her child, it's her own child. There is nothing wrong also seeking the help of her husband, because after all, the child is a minor. If a person is an adult, the father cannot force them, but it's a matter of persuasion, really. So the mother could still influence, uh, you know, a child in majority. Uh, but, like I said, it, you cannot really get the stepfather to tell him, do this or do that, except by way of advice, because otherwise it, you might create much more tension uh, in the household. <laughs>